Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of the Camels with Hammers show. My name is Daniel Finca. I am the host of the Camels with Hammers show and the blogger at camelswithhammers.com, which you can find on the Patheos blog network. I'm not going to introduce our panelists, but they're all very uh, accomplished and passionate activists on behalf of secularism. You will be able to read under their names their descriptions. I will only introduce one of the panelists by name and I I identify them. Uh, the issue that brings us together, and we're going to have not only the people you see with us now, but throughout the evening we're going to be adding people. Uh, each time, each, each uh, visitor or participant has a time limit they can speak. Uh, so that we could create some sense of balance and allow everyone to be participant and not monopolize. Different people have different amounts of time so that we could wait so that opinions were represented fairly equally. I want to start out by quickly explaining the very broad facts of the issue and laying out a, a few arguments that are important to me and then we'll turn it over to our esteemed panelists. Um, the very first thing it, to, to note is what's going on. So the Ohio State Legislature has approved uh, plans for a Holocaust memorial and the uh, ostensive secular purpose of this memorial is to commemorate the fact that, or to acknowledge the fact and warn people of the fact that the Holocaust began with laws that were oppressive. And as a result of this, uh, lawmakers have a responsibility not to create the kinds of laws that would lead to something as heinous as the Holocaust and other genocides. Now, the issue that makes this controversial is that they are going to be using a Star of David uh, in, in a prominent monument, and they do not have any equally uh, visible, at least from far away, uh, acknowledgments of the other victims of the Holocaust and the Freedom From Religion Foundation has written a letter to the Ohio State Legislature accusing them of violating the separation of church and state if they go through with this design and build this one more. It's still only in the proposal. Uh, it's been accepted the proposal but they've not yet built it. It is primarily funded privately. It has a bit of state funds for the installation. The Freedom From Religion Foundation is arguing that a religious symbol on the state grounds without other representation of equal uh, noticeability for other groups would be tantamount to the endorsement of religion. The American Atheists have, uh, uh, and we have Dave Moscato with us to represent them, and he's an official PR person for them so he, we can assume he speaks to a large extent for the organization. Uh, they have come out, in, you know, supporting the FFRF's position, uh, claiming on uh, Fox News, David Silverman went on and, and he made some remarks um, that, that, that the Holocaust had many more victims and that by only focusing on the Jews were somehow endorsing uh, religion. And he had the following exchange. He said, it's going to look like a temple. It's going to look like a Jewish shrine it's going to look like a synagogue. And it's important that we not give the Holocaust to just the Jews. There was a lot of people who died. The anchor said, but you have to admit that they were the primary target. It was about exterminating them. A lot of these other groups were kind of roped into that because they may have supported or they were equated as somehow less than favorable because they were in some way equated to being, you know, at the level of a Jewish person. This was about targeting the Jewish nation. Silverman said it was about eugenics, okay? It was about creating an Aryan race. The anchor said with Jews as the primary target. Silverman said, yeah, they were a primary target, but they were not the only target, and they shouldn't, they shouldn't be the only ones that are celebrated, memorialized, and they should, not, not, they should not be given that impression. Now, so this remark has subjected uh, the American atheists to a lot of uh, accusations of Holocaust denial. Uh, which I don't believe at all they are trying to do. Now, my objection to this, um, to this opposition that they're laying out is the following, is that the separation of church and state, its, it's, it's authentic meaning, its valuable meaning, is to prevent the government from making anyone feel like they either have to be religious rather than irreligious, or like they have to follow a specific religion. So when the government uses religious symbols as 
part of the government functioning or religious language or religious instruction, it is telling the citizens they have to be religious in some way to be a full civic member or to be an ideal member of the society. Deal, a deal, an ideal citizen would be religious in this way. What I want to say is that memorializing genocide victims with their symbol is not endorsing their religion. It's, there's, a, there's a complete difference. And atheists, if we interpret the symbol as automatically being endorsement, we're showing a crudity in ability to read symbols. And we are, uh, we are, we are, we are we're equating all religious expression with promulgation of belief, even in the case where we have a minority religion, a non-proselytizing religion, a historical context in which that star signifies the mark, of the, 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 the patch that was put on the cloth of the people who were sent to the death camps, the Jews. And the Jews were central to the Holocaust. Uh, this, it, it, it was, like, as the anchor said, they were the primary targets, the others came afterwards. In order to say that this shouldn't be so Jewish, essentially, uh, because because uh, Mr. Silverman is arguing that that's a religion only and that the star is only a religious symbol and not an ethnic one. In order to say that it should not be so Jewish, he's gone to these great lengths to try and deny the centrality of the Jews to the Holocaust because apparently, I I'm inferring from him, that if he conceded the Jews were especially essential, then maybe he could acknowledge that having a, them over, you know, having them predominantly emphasized in the memorial is legitimate. So to prevent that, he's trying to deny the centrality of the Jews to the Holocaust, and unfortunately, this is rhetoric that mirrors the uh, you know anti-Semitic and Holo Holocaust denial language, and this is far afield from the purpose of the secular movement. Is what I want to argue um, that that we shouldn't be getting into fights with Jews over over whether or not they're trying to own the Holocaust for themselves. That is a terrible line of argument. Um, it, it, it's, we're not qualified to get into any kind of dispute on that, um, and, 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 it, and it flies in the face of the history. And the important thing to say here is that even if we can, on the law, get this removed by precedence for any symbol having this function, even though legally I don't think we can, even if we could, we shouldn't. There are some things we shouldn't do, uh, even if we can. And I, there are plenty of uh, religious people who try and use the First Amendment to extend religious privilege beyond what it deserves, and we repudiate that, uh, even if they can do it technically, because the Supreme Court's favored them, it shouldn't. And so we're going to talk some more, and so I want to say that at the front, even if the legal case does go against me, if, you, if, you're, if you're convinced that legally they could have a case and win this at the Supreme Court, which I don't think they could, and I'll uh, cite something later about that, even if you thought that they could, um, they shouldn't, because this is not an endorsement of the Jewish religion. Ohio has less than, uh, it was only 1.3% Jewish. There is no way whatsoever that, the, that, that anybody is, in the Ohio legislature is endorsing Judaism. An historical context justifies that symbol. Supreme Court's backed that up, will back that up. We will lose, it'll embarrass us, and it's entangling us far from the cause of staying focused on the First Amendment and secularism. And so in order to uh, kick things off, I'm going to let Dave Moscato uh, start with, uh, with uh, and he can take a, a few minutes um, to, to give a rebuttal on behalf of American Atheists. And then it's up to you to, to um, moderate yourselves. I'll just jump in if necessary. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay. So um, let's get started. Uh, so uh, I want to start off by saying that my family is Jewish. Uh, I was raised kind of semi-Jewish. My mom is a deist, but uh, she's Jewish by ethnicity. Um, we recognize, I'm, I'm speaking for American atheists also, we recognize that the uh, Star of David is a symbol of ethnic Judaism as well as a symbol of Judaism, the religion. And I would say that really the main issue here is just excessive entanglement between religion and government. If there's a way to avoid excessive entanglement, um, that really makes the most sense to me. And basically, the way that this happened, there were several designs that they had to choose from. They had three that were runner-ups, uh, runners-up that they brought before the committee that was choosing this. There were nine people on that committee. Uh, State Senator Richard Finan was the chair of that committee, and uh, he was the only person who voted against 
uh, this design. The two other runners up did not have any kind of prominent religious symbol included. Um, and I think the, the point that I want to make with that is that two thirds of the people designing, uh, who, who had finalist designs for this monument, did not think it was necessary uh, to include a huge religious symbol in order to make the point that this is a, a good design for memorial for the Holocaust. And there are different ways to, to define Holocaust. Some people define it as specifically the extermination of the Jewish people uh, during you know the World War II time. Um, I think that's too narrow of a definition, personally. Um, I think most people uh, would define the Holocaust as the entire uh, series of, of exterminations surrounding um, the concentration camps and so on in Germany at that time, which would include gay people, which would include uh, disabled people, which would include uh, Romani people, uh, about 1.5 million of them died. Overall, about 40% of the people who died uh, at, at the hands of the Nazis were not Jewish. And that's not to say that the Jews were not the, the bulk of the victims or that the Jews were not the, the primary target of the Holocaust or of uh, the, the Nazi um, effort. But I think, for one thing, we are not giving enough credit, or uh, that's not the right word, we're not, we're not paying enough tribute to the people who died who weren't Jewish by showing so much favoritism toward the Jewish people with just displaying the Jewish star. If a reasonable person were to walk by this memorial design, the one that uh, ended up winning with the large Jewish star, they wouldn't see this and say, oh, this is a uh, memorial for everybody who died. They would say this is a memorial for Jewish people, whether you're talking about Jewish ethnic people or Jewish religious people. And the Nazis didn't make a distinction between those two, and they didn't care if you were practicing Jew or not. Um, but I think it's important to note that the Star of David has been historically uh, and more importantly now uh, seen as a religious symbol for Judaism. You don't uh, tend to see people who are um, ethnic Jews but have converted to some other religion uh, displaying stars of David you know, on jewelry or, or anything like that. Um, the government has uh, established that, uh, say if you're in the military um, and you say that you're Jewish, the symbol that they put on your tombstone if you die and have a military burial is the Star of David. But if you're Jewish uh, ethnically, but you have converted to Christianity, and so you tell the military that I'm Christian, when you die, if you have a military burial, they'll put on your tombstone a cross. It does. It's not the symbol. The symbol doesn't stay with you just because you're an ethnic Jew. Um, and the same thing if you're if you're an atheist. Like if I were in the military and I died, uh, they would put the symbol for atheism on my tombstone instead of the Star of David, even though I'm an ethnic Jew. Uh, and even more to the point, I think um, you can you can really tell that it's a symbol for religious Judaism and not just for ethnic Judaism, uh, because there are people who are not ethnic Jews, uh, but practice Judaism, who display the Star of David, um, which they wouldn't do if it wasn't the, if it was just the symbol for ethnic Jews or primarily the symbol for ethnic Judaism. So um, the fact that this is widely known as a religious symbol, even though it's not exclusively a religious symbol, I think excessively entangles religion and government. And we're not talking about a small amount of money here. Um, it's, it's not, I mean, the way that Dan introduced this, he made it sound like it was, um, you know, just uh, grading the, the ground or something like that. It's $300,000 is how much we're talking about. Um, and the, the total cost of this project is $2.3 Two million of that was raised by private funds, but this is on government land. This is uh, going to be at the state house in Columbus, um, and it's not an insignificant amount of money that the state is going to be kicking in. Plus, uh, it's my understanding that the state is going to be maintaining it because it's on their property. So, I think it's it's important that we recognize first of all that this isn't an insignificant project now, but second of all that this is setting precedent that we don't want to set as 
atheist activists fighting for separation of religion and government. If And I hate to, to make this appear to be a slippery slope argument because that's not what I'm trying to do. But there are some cases where slippery slopes are a real issue, and I think this is one of them. If we allow a questionably religious symbol to be uh, very prominently displayed on public land using public money, the next time that something similar to this comes up where it's not as in, as arguably a religious symbol, but it's more clear-cut of a religious symbol, they can point to this, uh, the, the people promoting that, and say, well, the last time we had something like this, uh, it went to court or whatever, and it ended up saying it was okay to have that there. And it just sets a precedent that I think we want to avoid. Um, and I'm not an attorney or a lawyer, so I, I don't want to get too much into this. I'll save that for Neil. But it's my understanding that through the lemon test, uh, the third point of the lemon test, if you can avoid uh, excessive entanglement, um, that's what you should do. And considering they had two other designs available to them that didn't entangle religion and government this way, it makes sense to me to do that. And I'm not the only one who feels this way. I mentioned earlier Richard Finan, the chair of the committee, uh, he voted against this design on the same grounds. And when he was outvoted, he resigned from the committee despite being the chair of the committee. Um, because he thought this was risky and inappropriate um, to give this much liability to the state of Ohio on on the matter of uh, entangling religion and government. So that's pretty much what I have to say, and I'm happy to uh, address uh, other concerns as they come up. I don't know how we're doing this exactly. If I can if I can pause my time and then talk some more, if if other people have uh, have questions about what I said. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you space out your time. Dave okay. has a lot of extra time. Uh, space out your time throughout the afternoon. I'm, I'm going to send you links about how much time you have left. Okay, sounds um, great. Before I send it over to anyone else, just two quick notes. Uh, a secular organization, the International Federation for Secular and Humanistic Judaism, an explicitly secular organization, uses the Star of David, indicating that there are some atheists who do this, even officially. Um, and, and another uh, quick point about uh, precedents, like you said, this would be used as precedents against us if there were a court ruling in favor of us. But if we don't bother to challenge this, there's no precedence argument there. Uh, well, so on this point, uh, why don't why don't let Trevor talk about that because it's a central point. Why don't we get to that right away? Trevor, would you like to talk about? That? Yeah, I, I agree actually with what Dave said when he said that he's worried about the precedent that we don't want to set here. You know, we have a model of what it's like to be successful in courts in social movements, and it comes from the LGBT movement. And it didn't come from taking on cases as soon as they came, taking on cases that we know we're going to lose. It comes from being very picky, finding cases that uh, garner public support, and this certainly isn't one of them. I mean, it's dividing our own community. Uh, as much as I would love the lemon test to still be the law of the land, it clearly is not. Uh, Justice Scalia referred to it as a late-night ghoul haunting the Establishment Clause jurisprudence, and it really is. It's, it's dead today. We don't have five uh, votes on the Supreme Court to, to do anything with this, and I hope, I hope that in the next ten years we'll find the fifth justice that we need to really get a real Establishment Clause back. We'll all agree with a lot of the things that they're saying, but the fact of the matter is we're not there, and overturning Supreme Court precedent takes decades and decades and when we're going after these sorts of cases now, where we don't have popular support, we don't have legal support, we're not going to win. And and I, I don't think that that's the best use of, of the resources of the movement right now. So I'm going to jump in here real quick. Uh, Dan, a point that you mentioned that I actually want to uh, basically correct you on is that there is actually constitutional relevance to delaying on pursuing a violation of the Establishment Clause. Van Orden v. Perry, which was the 2005 Ten Commandments case, uh, Breyer wrote the controlling opinion, and he said, this particular display is a real borderline, but because nobody complained about it for 40 years, we're going to let it stand. And so that actually does have relevance if we don't bring the case. Um, yeah, I, I want to jump in because I actually got to hear Van Orden lecture, and I'm right here in Texas and have seen that monument many times. Uh, there was... Uh, an, an identical case at the same time in, uh, was it Kentuck Kentucky? Kentucky. Allegheny yeah, County, County, Kentucky. Right. And the, the Ten Commandments monument in Kentucky was removed, and the reason was that it hadn't been up for so long. And so uh, that's, that's a good point that you're making, that sometimes the difference 
between leaving these overt religious symbols up and not doing it is uh, how long it how long goes by without uh, without it actually being challenged. Um, so yeah, a lot of times that's the difference. I guess I guess I'll jump here in here and say something. Um, I mean, I I think I take the view that even if we construe the Star of David to be an entirely religious symbol, it does not represent excessive entanglement of state and church to put up a Holocaust memorial featuring that symbol. And the reason why I believe that is because I think there's such because firstly, no reasonable person viewing that monument could possibly interpret it as the state of Ohio encouraging people to become Jews. Like, if for someone to look at that monument, to read the inscriptions, to read the story that the broken, and it's important to note that it's a broken Star of David, not a complete Star of David, which is a reference to a story about two cousins who were separated during the Holocaust, and it's, that story is inscribed on the monument itself, so it's a very explicit reference to a part of the design. Someone looking at that monument in, in toto I don't think could reasonably take away from it that the state of Ohio is attempting to encourage people to convert to the Jewish faith. And I think that anyone making that interpretation will be acting unreasonably, will be ignoring historical facts and facts about the actual monument. And for that reason, even though we might consider it some level of entanglement between state and church, I don't think it would reasonably be considered an excessive entanglement of state and church. And furthermore, this sort of memorializing is precisely what I want a secular government to be doing. I want to live in a country where the government can decide to memorialize the attempted extermination of minorities, Jewish people, Romanis, LGBTQ people, and otherwise, uh, and, and others, in memorials such as this. I think it's highly appropriate that a secular government should remind us of the ethical atrocities of the past for the purpose of public education, of keeping the memory of those sorts of event current, those sorts of events current, and so I think that I, I want the monument to be put up. I don't see any good legal or ethical case for opposing it, and I think that to make the interpretation of a monument such as this that the state of Ohio wishes people to become Jewish. I mean, think about what you're saying. Uh, it sounds a little macabre to say this, but if you take that interpretation, you're saying that by drawing people's attention to the fact that in the past millions upon millions of Jewish people were exterminated by the government people will take that to be an encouragement to become Jewish that's what your argument is if you say this is promoting the religious faith I think that's ridiculous I think it's highly unreasonable and I think on on that basis there's no reason to oppose this one yeah. James I find you persuasive and I'm very thankful that I have not made any of those arguments um, I think the there, there are several issues here, and I'll go ahead and take a little bit of my time to kind of give the, my opening statement, as it were, is that the legal test that we're dealing with here is endorsement. Um, I agree with Trevor that, you know, the vitality of lemon is in question. Um, the, the whole establishment clause jurisprudence at the Supreme Court is a bit of a mess. And one of the tests that we're seeing applied more and more frequently is the endorsement test. And the endorsement test isn't about whether people are coerced or pressured to become a member of a religion. It's not about whether the state is saying you should be Jewish. It's about whether the state is endorsing or disfavoring religion or irreligion. Either way. And that's the test under which I say that this particular design, not the concept of a Holocaust memorial generally, not some of the other designs that are put forth, not this particular design, perhaps tweaked a few different ways, but this particular design on public land with a single prominent symbol that is unquestionably religious, religious in nature, excuse me, the symbol may also have other meanings as well. It's not necessarily, you know, 100% religious, but it's unquestionably it has religious meaning. That that it violates the endorsement test. How so? Can you explain how it, it constitutes an endorsement? Well, I don't think it matters. The endorsement test is dead. I would agree with Neil if you know we still had O'Connor running this court. But, but the fact of the matter is Justice Kennedy hasn't been as favorable to any sort of you know establishment clause test that works well for us. Uh, and, and in addition, you know, 
I, I think that the courts have been comfortable with things like nativity scene for exactly what you've been saying, uh, uh, James. It negates the idea that you're promoting a religion. And so I guess I'm wondering how, under Neil's version of the Establishment Clause, the courts have continued to allow nativity scenes as long as there's things like Santa Clauses and, and other Christmas uh, decorations that, again, you know, negate the idea that you're actually trying to convert people to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the way my constitutional law professor many years ago uh, described it is the reindeer rule. Um, and it's an oversimplification, but as I was doing you know, some, some additional research getting ready for uh, this show, um, you know, I've I seen case after case where they're saying uh, if you have more than just a single religious symbol standing alone, then it's less, much less likely to be endorsement. It's much less likely to be seen as the government saying that religion in general or this particular religion is a good thing. And so um, in that regard, you know, again, there are other symbols that are available to be added uh, to the design. And I believe that that would cure the constitutional defect. But can, can you just explain to me how this memorial, as designed, is saying, in your words, that Judaism is a good thing? Can you tell me what elements of the actual memorial convey that message? The large, prominent religious symbol that is the centerpiece of the memorial. So just a religious symbol being there means that it's saying it's a good thing. How no. do you get a positive valence about just because it's there? No, it's not that it's there. It's that it is the only religious symbol or the only symbol that is relevant to the subject matter, uh, whether it's, you know, celebrating the numerous holidays and celebrations that take place in December or thereabouts. Um, you know, in that case, you know, you'll often have a Christmas tree and a menorah uh, and a crash. Um, but, in, but if we've got simply a single symbol, and that symbol is given prominence, it's the centerpiece of the design, uh, then that is treating that symbol favorably. It is the government placing it on high. I mean, literally, as you walk up, you have to look up in order to see it. But the um, reason that that symbol is being prioritized is not because of a favoritism towards the Jewish religion, but, in a, but a favorable, uh, like, like, like an, an emphasis on the Jewish people, and there's a historical reason to do that in this case. So you have to look at the context of why that symbol is being prioritized. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the government cannot well, use. Uh, I, I I wanted to talk a little about. I'm going to go ahead and see the floor. Can I can interrupt or? Yeah, that's your question. Sorry. Come again? Yeah, please, Mally, go. Yeah, please, Mally. Okay. Um, we <laughs> we keep talking about the uh, the hexagram like it without the real historic context, and it it seems a little pompous of me to jump in, but the the context of it in the Holocaust is being completely ignored. Now, I've heard people suggest that like a pink triangle incorporated into the design would be fantastic. And while I agree with that, I don't think people understand why the pink triangle would be fantastic. So the Nazis did not just use stars. They used a system of triangles. So their road hazard signs were right side up triangles as such. They decided to go with the triangle shape because it meant hazard and warning. They inverted the triangle for most people. So the upside down pink triangle, for example, was for gays. Um, upside down brown, I believe, was for gypsies. Black was political dissenters, et cetera, et cetera. Gold triangle upside down meant Jewish. Now, if you were Jewish but also gay, you would get a gold triangle upside down and a pink triangle right side up. In the context of the Holocaust, that cannot be considered a religious symbol. That's just historically ignorant. And, and I don't mean that in a mean way. It's just they, there was a system of classification using these triangles. And I'm sure they were delighted that it looked like the Star of David. But if we're talking about the Holocaust, that's no more of a religious symbol than if we were to make a, a uh, I don't know, a, a museum of the Romans and the section on torture featured crosses. It's simply an image that was used at that time. It conveys, hey, you know, this, this is something that was used in the Holocaust. It has nothing to do with Judaism religiously with the Star of David in the context of the Holocaust. And maybe most people wouldn't know that, but I'd rather see the FFRF and 
you know, the SSA, for example, um, secular organizations promote an accurate view of history than to spend all this time and effort trying to have this symbol taken down. If you have a problem with it as a religious symbol, let's educate people that in that context it's not a religious symbol. Yeah, I'll add that um, in, the, in the historical context and the sociological context that exists in this memorial, the Jewish star is by far the most recognizable, the most well understood, and the most immediately relevant symbol that exists. Uh, Neil was talking about the fact that there weren't other symbols and comparing it to the nativity, but if we had a month in which there was a prominent religious holiday of one religion and not of others, it would be totally unreasonable to ask that other religions provide symbols just so that we wouldn't have the appearance of endorsement, if that's the only symbol that's currently relevant. And if you ask people what they think about the Holocaust, they'll talk about Jews, and that's more or less accurate, of course there are other victims and those people ought to be remembered, and if you think that that's an important public education project, then you're welcome to support it. But there's nothing intrinsically unreasonable about making a Jewish star the primary element of a memorial. And if I can talk, I mean this is bizarre, on an architectural point for a brief moment, Daniel Liebeskind is a really well-known architect. He designed the Jewish Museum in Berlin, which is an astonishing feat of architecture and beauty and elegance, and it has a lot to do with brokenness. The museum is at cross angles and um, exhibits are meant to be broken up. And that's what you have here. You have a broken Jewish star that people have to walk through. They have to play the part of a victim in order to understand the monument, um, or the memorial, pardon me. Um, and, and so we have this confluence that makes it, maybe for some people not optimal, but totally reasonable to have the symbol without needing to posit any endorsement or any favoritism of a Jewish primary relevance to the Holocaust. Let me also make some other quick point about that. Is that even if this was, like, like, and let me ask, let me put the question to Dave. Were there a religious minority, say the Copts were targeted in Egypt, and there was a, or, or, or a Muslim group was targeted somewhere, let's say a Muslim group was targeted somewhere, and, and, a, and there was a specific memorial for that specific genocide as an example of all attacks on religious minorities. And if, and if the state of Ohio wanted to say, especially the state of Ohio well, with very few Muslims, if they wanted to say, we want to honor the right of religion by memorializing the victims of this religious genocide, I would feel like using the crescent would be the appropriate symbol to memorialize a religious group. And I believe that would be a secular purpose because part of separation of church and state is defense of the right to a religion. And especially when you, if, 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 if in a narrow, targeted way, the state puts up a memorial specifically for the members of a specific faith, memorializing their specific targeting, the symbol of their faith is actually evocative in the right way. You know, it's the only thing that actually symbolizes them properly. In fact, I've often looked, I've, I've in previously looked at Holocaust museums and gone, huh, weird that that doesn't look anything Holocaust in, in my mind. I think it's appropriate that, 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 yeah, that now, now, of course, this isn't just the Jews here, uh, but, but even if this was just the Jews, uh, you know, if, if this was just the Jews, and, and, and if the star was just a symbol of religion and not ethnic, I would still support it as the memorial of a specific genocide. Dave, would you support that? Well, I mean, like you were saying, that's not the case that we have here. Uh, but if if there well, were, you? if there were some situation where, uh, for example, we were uh, memorializing uh, the genocide of a specific religious group, if we're doing this on government land with government funding, I would question the appropriateness of that. Uh, I think if it can be done without the prominent display of a religious symbol, then we should make an attempt to do that. And in this case, in this case uh, we have two viable options that were just outvoted. And like I was saying before, uh, you know, two out of three people that were brought brought up to uh, design a, a memorial didn't. It didn't occur to them, or they decided that it wasn't necessary to prominently include a, a Star of David in this design in order to accomplish the task of uh, memorializing the Holocaust. And I think that because it can be done without entangling religion and government, that 
we should opt for that if for no other reason than just to avoid the potential for entanglement, whether it's excessive or not. But, but why but, pick but this why battle? This battle? I, I don't understand that. I mean, we're fresh off the heels of AA going after the, the 9-11 memorial, obviously unsuccessfully in federal courts so far. You're not going to get a ton of popular support behind this. We have to realize at some point that constitutional law isn't what we find in our case books, and there's also you know, a human element to it. There's a legal realism of what the courts are willing to do. And I just don't see any court in this country that would be willing to come out and say you have to stop this Holocaust memorial in the same way they're never going to come out and say you have to stop this 9-11 memorial. I mean, why are we picking these fights that we're going to lose that don't get us any popular support, that do nothing for the movement other than throw away money? Well, to be absolutely clear, we don't oppose a Holocaust memorial. We don't even oppose a Holocaust memorial on public land using government using taxpayer funds. What we oppose is specifically this design that includes a prominent religious symbol because it's on government land using taxpayer funds. If it were not the case that this were on government land using taxpayer funds and prominently featuring a religious symbol, we would have no objection. If they had chosen a different design, we would have no objection. If they had decided to do this on private land using completely private funds, we would have no objection. It's just the design that we have an objection to, not the Holocaust memorial in itself. Sure, but this isn't the only, you know, uh, establishment clause related issue happening in the country right now. I mean, we can look to the South and we see, you know, a lot of cases being taken by the ACLU and uh, American Humanist Association for things where city council members are, are starting meetings with proselytizing prayers or graduations for high school students are being held in churches where there's giant uh, crosses in the front and they're handing out pamphlets with information on Christianity. I mean, those seem like the battles to fight. You treat it as if this is the only one out there, and AA either has to take it or FFRF has to take it, or no one will, and and that's the only case on our on our table. There's uh, clearly Trevor. more. Why why pick this one? Uh, Trevor, real quick, FFRF is go also going after those other cases. I don't see where this is FFRF divert, diverting resources that would otherwise be used. But I'll go ahead and hand it off to Dave as he was talking. Well, I mean, every every organization has finite resources, and any time you devote any resources to one battle, you're taking the potential of using those resources elsewhere. So uh, it, it is diverting uh, resources away from, from other fights. Um, I do want to make absolutely clear to anybody watching this who isn't aware, uh, this is FR, FF, excuse me, FFRF's baby. Um, they're the ones who started it and wrote the letter. Um, the reason that uh, we were brought into this, uh, Fox News got in touch with us because were very close to New York City, and they wanted somebody in their studio to give a live interview about uh, the atheist point of view on this. So we got involved in that way. Um, yeah, because I, yeah. obviously the atheist point of view is so consistent on this right. issue. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, I just I just want to make sh make sure everybody understands uh, for the people watching this that uh, we're not trying to take the credit for it, and we're not trying to to uh, steal FFRO's thunder. Um, but that said, uh, I, I do agree, and, and Dave Silverman agrees with FFRF's position on it, that if we can avoid entanglement, that that's the, the smart thing to do. Um, as far as uh, pursuing this instead of other cases, um, it's my understanding that FFRF is actually not suing. They sent a letter. Uh, I'm not sure what their plans are to follow up with that. Uh, our policy here is that we don't send letters like that unless we're willing to take it all the way to the Supreme Court um, just because we don't want to start something that we're not prepared to follow through. I don't know what FFR's policy is. I would be surprised if it's not similar. Um, usually 90% of the time, 90 plus percent of the time, sending a letter is enough to solve these types of problems. Somebody will get a letter like that and say, oh, uh, if there's an issue, then we'll fix it, and they fix it. 2% of the time or whatever, the, it goes farther and they fight it uh, and then it, it continues. But um, I, I do think that this is not necessarily the most important thing going on in the country right now. I think that there is a good reason that we shouldn't say nothing uh, for the reason that Neil mentioned earlier that uh, if, you, if you let things slide then uh, it's harder to get them removed later. But uh, yeah, we are going after other things. FFRF is going after other things. 
Um, this may not be the perfect, ideal time as far as precedent and as far as the who's on the Supreme Court right now to uh, to take this one. Um, and it may not be a popular one to take, but when you're talking about uh, civil rights activism, you have to uh, consider that sometimes you're going to do things that aren't popular with the public for sure, and sometimes you're going to have to do things that aren't popular within your movement also. That happens all the time with every type of civil rights activism. Um, but that's not a good reason, I think, just because it's, it's not necessarily a popular move to not move on something that you see as a violation. Okay. Somebody has to be willing to stand up and the say, is, this is wrong. The question these is are, why it's bad. not popular, right? Sorry, you can go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, these don't, don't point to other civil rights movements as examples of, of where these things have worked. I mean, we look at the civil rights movement of the 60s, where the NAACP had a brilliant legal strategy, where they took small cases to build up to Brown v. Board of Education. If they tried to bring Brown in 1910, they would have easily lost the case. We see, again, the LGBT movement that took a state-by-state -state approach, approach to win uh, marriage equality in several states before their first federal lawsuit, which most of the movement still thought came too quickly. I mean, what, what we're doing in the secular movement right now is self-destructive. And, and I don't understand why we can't follow what these other civil rights movements have done and, and take the politically unpopular cases when we can actually win them. And, and I, I guess I'm, I'm shocked that anyone here can actually, actually believe that this is a case that five members of the Supreme Court would come out on our side for. Yeah, and furthermore, um, Dave, you said that what's most important to you is to ensure that the, the rule you're following is avoid entanglement, right? And you want to fight for that on a legal level and, and utilizing all kinds of other strategies as well. But that frankly seems like following a rule blindly. And to sort of jump off what Trevor is saying, all cases are not created equal. And simply because they involve a religious symbol on public land doesn't mean that context isn't important. I frankly have to say that before this happened, I would have thought that a Jewish star on a Holocaust memorial would have been the thought experiment we would use to say, oh, that would be okay, and we should compare all other incidences of religious, religious symbols on public land in how far they are away from that. So I guess my question to you is, in what context, what, what wouldn't be too far? I think, I mean, Ideally, you don't want any religious symbols on government land being paid for by government funds, is, is my perfect world. In, in a secular system like ours... A, a government a doesn't government have a reasonable have a, interest. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting sorry. a ton of feedback. Could you say I'm that sorry. again? Yeah, so you think there's no reasonable government interest in utilizing religious symbols in a context in which they are not serving a religious purpose? Would the example I provided of uh, you know a piece on Roman history featuring crosses strike you as an endorsement of religion? No, um, it wouldn't. But if it's if it's specifically and explicitly about torture in in Roman times, um, and it just shows uh, among other types of torture devices that they used or execution devices that they used crosses, I wouldn't see that as as promoting a religion. But in this case, uh, this memorial is not, it's not designed to show the different symbols that the Nazis used. It's a Star of David. And the reason that they chose that for the design is to make us, uh, make a viewer of this think of Judaism. And I, I know that before you were talking about um, most people don't know is the phrase that you used. All this background about the, you know, uh, the the different types of symbols that they use for the different colors and the different types of triangles and things. On uh, on Wikipedia, there's an excellent chart that shows all the different ones. But most people don't know that. And the test that that we use, and like I said, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I'm not trying to to speak out here on something I don't know. But it's my understanding that the test that we use is: would a reasonable person look at this and say this is uh, promoting or endorsing religion over irreligion or one religion over other religions. And a reasonable person uh, is not necessarily uh, extremely educated in the, that fine level of detail about concentration camp identification symbolism. Uh, James, uh, David, can I, can I jump in? Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to uh, actually, this is, uh, Ron, Ron Lindsay uh, has given me something I can read. Uh, okay. To his position. And he's actually going to differ with that standard in this. Okay. Ron sure. Lindsay writes, I will limit myself to addressing the legal implications of using the Star of David as a visible symbol in the proposed Holocaust memorial. It would not be advisable to bring a legal action challenging use of this symbol, as under current law, such a lawsuit would almost certainly fail. The relevant Supreme Court test is whether the use of this symbol could be construed, uh, considered an endorsement of religion in general or a particular religion. In applying the test, a court considers whether an objective observer who is acquainted with the relevant facts, including the history of the symbol display, would perceive it as a government endorsement of religion in general or a particular religion. The Supreme Court has explained the purpose behind this test is an effort to ensure that the government does not send a message that members of a religious group are favored members of the political community. For the reasons that you, Dan, have set forth in some of your blog posts, including the one on July 27, no objective observer who is familiar with the Nazi campaign of genocide against the Jews, including the Nazis' use of the Star of David as a means of identifying Jews, would consider the use of the Star of David in connection with proposed memorial as an endorsement of religion. Moreover, the notion that the Ohio State government is sending a message that Jews are favored members of the political community is preposterous. There has been some debate about whether complaints about the proposed use of the Star of David for the memorial make atheists look bad, and there has been a meta-debate about whether atheists should be concerned about looking bad. I am not going to comment on those issues. I will only say that a lawsuit would make the plaintiffs look uninformed about applicable law and could wind up creating precedent that will make it more difficult to bring meritorious lawsuits over religious symbols on public property. So his standard that he cited here is an objective observer informed of the relevant facts of history. Uh, may I take a turn? Sure. Um, so I, I come, I also come from a cultural Jewish background, so I tend to be a little bit biased uh, on issues that touch on Judaism. But on the other hand, uh, I've, I've tried very hard to be sort of a firebrand for atheism in general, and so. As much as I usually hate this guy, I'm going to be the wishy-washy guy who has points to make on both sides. <laughs> um, first of all, in favor of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, I would say, um, yeah, absolutely the Jewish star is a symbol of Judaism, and I think that, that nobody does themselves any favors by trying to deny that. Uh, I also think that, that atheists have kind of a, re a reputation for going after religious symbols, like, you know, oh, we've got a giant cross on government property, and we should get rid of that. And when we do that, um, guys like, let's say, Bill O'Reilly are able to come at us and say, oh, look, these guys are biased because, you know, they wouldn't go after Muslims or Jews in the same way. Um, they're, they're just, they just have it in for Christianity, right? And so not going after symbols of other religion kind of makes them right on that. Um, and, and it gives them ammo a little bit. And so that's one side as far as I Can see I it. Can I address that point in two seconds? Just that okay, one? Sure. There's a context to this one which is really relevant. Atheists uh -huh. have long spoken out, myself included, on the Friendly Atheist, which is a well-known site about um, about uh, separate seating women in the back on buses of Orthodox Jews in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. in Mea Sharim, which is um, in, in Jerusalem, in uh, B'nai Brak, which is also in Jerusalem, and um, New Square, which uh, is a neighborhood of upstate New York in which women and men uh, walk on different sides of the sidewalk. Um, we speak about those things, and they may not come up as often because they aren't as prevalent in our society. You're but totally we right. Don't talk You're about them. Absolutely. But I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's a really good point. Um, okay, so on the other side, if you're going to uh, memorialize the Holocaust, which I think you absolutely should, you are totally talking about Jews. I mean, just like I don't want to deny that Judaism is a religious symbol, I don't want to. I also don't want to deny that a Holocaust is primarily thought of as a thing that happened disproportionately targeting Jews. Um, 
And uh, I, I feel like in atheist culture, we sometimes have a tendency to overlook or dismiss even real religious persecution, like maybe persecution that happens in non-Christian countries to Christians. I mean, those are things that actually happen. Um, the, the thing that I wonder about this case is... What's it going to accomplish specifically? I mean, there are several things that it could accomplish. It could be accomplishing something from a legal standpoint. And here's where I agree with Trevor, who's gone now, when, when he said that, you know, in this court environment, it's not going to accomplish anything legally. From a PR standpoint, I think even people who are in favor of it, of it are agreeing that it's not going to win many friends for atheists. Um, and from a moral high ground standpoint, I'm not sure that it's really winning anything particularly either. The, th the thing about comparing uh, different types of religious symbols is that we ought to have like a general principle to figure out whether something is right no matter what symbol is being used or wrong in what symbol is being used. And I think that this kind of comes down to the difference between sort of punching up and punching down, <laughs> the, the difference between going after a minority and a majority religion, um, because I think there, by and large, isn't a large contextual movement to make our government Jewish. Uh, and, and because of this, bringing this kind of lawsuit contributes to a perception that atheists are being bullies uh, not not because of consistency issues, but because this is very much a case where we're going after a group that doesn't, on the face of it, have that have nearly as much power as groups that put giant Ten Commandment monuments in public squares. Okay, I'm done. Can I okay. jump in very quickly? Oh, yeah. oh do you please. want to go, Chana? No, please. Yeah. I, I I just spoke. Please. No, I'm British. I can't possibly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll make two quick points. One, I do understand. I, I have heard those arguments that we only address um, Christians and that we hate Christians. Um, and I do understand wanting to make sure that that allegation isn't valid. But in addition to the point I made earlier that we do address Jewish questions and Muslim questions, um, and I do think we should listen to what people say. I don't think we should specifically base our strategy on what Bill O'Reilly thinks. Um, <laughs> Sorry if I gave the impression that. I <laughs> no, no. Of course, I don't think you think that. I just wanted to throw that out there. And two, not only are we not making friends with this, I frankly think this is fairly alienating to a large percentage of Jewish atheists who make up a pretty large percentage of the atheist community. Um, I don't think, as a Jewish atheist, I don't think I've ever had to defend the connection between Judaism and the Holocaust before to atheists. Um, and of course, the majority of people are not this way, but on Daniel's blogs, the comments, and, and also the comment threads on Facebook have had a fair number of virulently anti-Semitic comments thrown in, um, which is something that I, I've never really seen in the atheist you community. You clarify, you mean anti-Semitism is a real thing, and and I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you as can, we've can been seeing give for a few years. Can you want to give examples? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to give examples. Yeah. Um, so in the Facebook thread, um, somebody used the phrase Zionist pigs, oh, well. um, if, if I recall correctly, um, and I why don't I let James talk, and I will find the specific quote that I actually posted on my own. Great. Oh, actually, did Russell want to reply? Because Hannah. Oh replied. yes, please. Get to James. I was addressing you. Thirty no, seconds. Russell. I agree with Hannah again, but I would like to use my thirty seconds to throw out a potential solution, which is that I I think it's been mentioned already that the solution that the courts have found acceptable to dealing with. Uh, uh, um, nativity displays is just throw all the religions at the wall and I think since everybody <laughs> has agreed that uh, more than one group was affected by the Holocaust maybe the solution isn't to take away the Jewish star but to add like a pink triangle for gay people and maybe like a purple triangle for Jehovah's Witnesses who were also who also got symbols and just look up all these symbols and I don't know, maybe even make them smaller than the Jewish star, but have them there. Okay, James expressed some consternation. No, I just, I, I do faces. 
Um, so I wanted to respond to something Russell said a little earlier about his desire to have a general rule by which to judge these cases. And I think I'm not sure whether I understood you correctly, but I mean, what I think is I actually don't want a general rule because I think that these how symbols function is extraordinarily complex and context dependent. And I think that we should judge each case on its merits depending on the context of that case. And that's why I think that the Dave's proposed rule that there should be no religious symbols on government land or funded by the government is very, very disturbing because it has all sorts of implications for educational displays. It has all sorts of implications for public schools. It has all sorts of implications that to me would actually dismantle certain very important functions of a secular government. So I, I would say that what we really want to do is look at every case in context and see how the symbols are functioning and ask ourselves, can this really, by a reasonable person who's informed of all the facts, be considered an endorsement of this religion? Now I actually have more of a problem with the nativity displays than I have with this memorial because the purpose, the symbolic purpose of a nativity display is to hold up and celebrate certain traditions, whether they're religious or not. That's what it's for. It's to put it in front of people and say, look, isn't this good? Isn't this fun? We all like this sort of thing. And so symbolically, there's clearly some sort of positive valence being added to the symbols there. But the fact that a symbol is prominent and large and high up doesn't on its own make it an endorsement. And in this case, as part of a memorial related to a particular story of a particular two individuals with a particular inscription and set of historical information on the side, with all the historical context of that, you, the use of that symbol added to it, I don't think a reasonable observer who's informed of all that could possibly conclude that the state of Ohio is attempting to endorse Judaism and say that Jews are a privileged part of the political community in Ohio. And that's why I think that I don't, I'm not talking about the strategic question. I think on ethical and legal grounds we should not oppose this monument. I want to see it. I want to go there. I think it's a good piece of public education. And I kind of applaud Ohio for putting up, like, can you imagine even 20 years ago them even considering a monument? which refers to the extermination of gay people and says we should remember this because it's a bad thing. I, this is what I want our secular government to be doing. I don't want to live in a country that, that bans it by law. I, can, I, can I jump in on this? Um, I, I, I agree that uh, one of the functions of, of government is to uh, be able to put up memorials such as this and, and to, to recognize when uh, society has gone south, like what happened with the uh, Holocaust. But uh, I, I, you know, I, I really have s some some severe reservations about. You know, I, I look at the design of the monument. I, I saw the picture, and you know, a casual observer walking by, looking at it. I, I mean, I, I have a hard time not imagining somebody looking at that and saying, you know, well, that has something to do with Judaism. I mean, it. it without understanding the context. Now I do understand, I, I have been listening and I understand that uh, that may not be uh, how the legal uh, works. I, I, I'm not a lawyer myself, but um, I, it's, it's you know, I, I somebody had I said in one of the internet chats about the um, uh, there's a, a plaque that describes the, the victims uh, 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 off to the side somewhere, but I, I just I, I wonder at uh, if, if the the symbol itself is not an outsized representation uh, the the way that the monument is designed. Now, as far as the moral issue, as far as whether we should do it or not, I'm I'm up in the air on that. I I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. Why are you up in the air? Uh, mainly because I I, I do. For practical reasons, for pragmatic reasons, I, I don't know whether. Um, well, first of all, I don't know whether it it is too much of a political hit on our community. Whether it's something, you know, whether the the gains uh, uh, outweigh the uh, uh, the liability. And I, I also don't know. I mean, if you know, right now, American Atheists, for example, has the uh, the 9/11 uh, memorial case that I'm assuming that they're going to be uh, appealing and so on and so forth. Uh, if we take a hit as a community on this particular case, uh, I, I wonder at how that may have negative repercussions for the 9/11 case. 
Okay, you're on your okay, you're on your little iPad with us. Okay. Um, uh, I'll jump in real quick and just say, um, as a lawyer, the any lawsuit, no lawsuit's been filed uh, yet here in Columbus, um, is not going to have an impact on the 9/11 case because the 9/11 case is currently pending before the Second Circuit. And any case here in Columbus would be filed in the Southern District of Ohio, and the Second Circuit generally doesn't listen to the Southern District of Ohio, and any appeal um, would go up to the Sixth Circuit. Um, so it's just based on the timelines and how long these things take to develop, uh, it's not going to impact the 9-11 case. Or at least I would be extraordinarily shocked if it did. Um, there's kind of a dead moment, so okay, okay. I, I wanted yeah. to talk about something before I left, and I may need to go do something shortly. Um, I've, I've really got to agree with James. This, this is this is beautiful, and I keep hearing people talk about the um, the alternate options and the fact that their existence being validation that this design was chosen because. Let me down my volume, um, because of the star or makes the star more prominent. Has anybody seen the other options? Has, has anyone seen them? I've seen All right, them. If, if we're going to go with the anti-arguments that we're playing to the lowest common denominator who doesn't know about history and can't see that symbols can mean more than one thing at once, I, w I, w I want to show you guys the other options. I've got them on my phone. I don't know if you guys can see that. That's that's one of the options. Um, does that say Holocaust Memorial to anyone? Does that convey any meaning? It looks like bad modern art to me. And I, I, I'm not a fantastic artist. It's my career. But it just looks like modern art on state property. It does not look like a Holocaust Memorial. The other one that I wanted to talk about, I'm allowed to be petty. I'm an artist. Um, is this one. It's, it's text. Um, the text reads, they went for days and days under the sun and under the rain and through the fields and the woods. Now, I don't think that we're using a religious symbol where something else would work. I think we're using the imagery and the monument that is beautiful and conveys Holocaust memorial where the other options conveyed modern art, bad or not. I, my, my apologies to the artists, I'm probably not as successful as they are. But neither of those convey any sort of meaningful message at all. The, the text could be interpreted as a message, but if we're interpreting text, the monument that's being proposed right now has perfectly viable text that we're all fine with that's completely inclusive. It's it's, it, it is bordering on revisionary to say, no, this is just a religious symbol. People are only going to see it as a relig religious symbol, but conversely, we should go with these other options that these same allegedly stupid, historically ignorant people are in no way going to connect to the Holocaust. It's, it's yep. one way or the other, guys. Like, you may be a patron. They're too stupid to get it or they're not. You may be a patron, so you understand how to be petty, but I'm assuming you're familiar with the patron coming to you and saying, none of these work, please go back to the drawing board. There's no reason we have to go with any of those. And, and I'd, I'd like to point out, like, for example, with the Vietnam Memorial in D.C., you know, what you have there is a, a very simple memorial with names of victims, and yet it's a very powerful thing when you go there. There's something in between, between something that has absolutely no meaning and something that, that may border on excessive entanglement. I mean, it, it, you, Those you were the, the finalists. Well, um, I understand that. <laughs> it's, it's not a, a small thing to go back and have submissions again and ask artists to take all this time to put designs together that may or may not make it. This is what I do for a living. I'm a commercial photographer and I do fine art photography. I'm the Las Vegas photographer of the year. I should have put that under my name. I know what I'm talking about. It's, it's not cheap. It's no small matter. But they you're suggesting we keep the symbol because it's And they chose three. She's, she's suggesting, I think, that, that 
there may be multiple reasons to not like the memorial as it stands. Plenty of people have lots of opinions on the artistic value or the religious value, but that there is a clear historical context. Even Dave, when he was introducing the topic, said that the intent of the Nazis was to destroy the Jewish nation. He didn't say Jewish religious people because it's well understood that there is a nation. And I really think Jonah, it's important. that's never been my contention. And if I can, you've been talking about context for the whole talk. If I can bring you to the larger context, I'd like to take some of my time to read you a quote. This comes from the governor of Ohio when he was talking about this, about this monument. And he wrote, we need to have remembrance in this state house. And I call on the Jewish community along with our brothers in faith to develop some sort of a memorial that members of our legislature and members of the public, as they pass through this great rotunda, they will be able to understand not just the history of a time when people couldn't stand, but the fact that it's today we must stand against evil. Ah, I'm sorry, I missed it. And I call on the Jewish community along with our brothers in faith. That brothers in faith is absolutely key here. Right at the outset, this was a monument with an explicit with an explicit religious message, and it was also an exclusionary comment because it said brothers in faith. Right at the outset, it was the Ohio government is making it very clear that there is an implicit religious undertone to this message compared to uh, other Holocaust memorials that you'll find. Now, if you want to talk about the Holocaust memorial on a tactical basis, that this is not a fight worth winning. This is not, you know, this is not something we can win at this time. I can certainly understand that, and I might even go through with that. But I'm, that's not what I'm hearing, especially from the lawyers. What they're doing is they're wrapping the tactical argument in with another argument that says that this is bad on an ethical basis, which I disagree with. I, I have to again put, point you out to the context that the, you know, no matter the the secular basis of the Star of David as a symbol, it is now a, in a, almost an explicitly religious symbol, and there's no way you can include that on a state monument without having some sort of establishment of a religion. And what I'm noticing is that a lot of people here are equating proselytization or selection of a religion as religious establishment. Those, those things, without being a lawyer, I've been led to understand that those things are not directly equitable. Um, and I, I find some problem with that. Uh, but, 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 you know, Sam, but I do have to say that there's... Oh, go right ahead. Yeah, but Sam, don't you think the meaning of the endorsement clause is to prevent the government from impo you know, making people think they have to join a religion? Isn't that the meaning, the whole reason we defend it in the first place? And we live in a political era where government, where people in the government, people with much power in the government, are trying exactly to say explicitly that. We're talking about an era of NPR ecumenicalism, where you don't have to believe in what I believe, but you have to believe in, some, in something with an undercurrent of dominionism. I mean, what I'm saying about the brothers in faith is, you guys are saying this isn't endorsing, they aren't telling you to go out and be Jewish, they aren't telling you to convert to Judaism. But the fact of the matter is, the, a lot of the, the, there's a lot of Christians who are going to be out there who see this as just an, who see this as a way of promoting Judeo-Christianism because they want they have a very special relationship with the Jewish nation and so there is a subtext of religion here that goes directly to religious privilege in this nation which I do not think we can ignore in the wider context. Yeah, um, I just want to say remember that. Uh, it's not just about endorsing or promoting uh, one religion over other religions. It's about religion over irreligion as well. And uh, by doing this, uh, yeah, by doing this, it's it's helping to promote the idea uh, that the government uh, favors the idea of religion. And I don't, I'm I like like uh, like Sam. I'm not a lawyer, um, but it's my understanding that the establishment clause isn't necessarily. Uh, like he was saying about proselytization, it's not necessarily um, the problem being uh, we're, we're communicating as a government that you are supposed to change your religion to the religion that we support. It's not, it's not necessarily about conversion. It's about the government showing favor to some religion over others or the government showing favor to religion in general over non-religion. And in the same way that uh, the government gives tax breaks to churches, um, and I oppose that on on basis of uh, separation of church and state, um, it's not, by giving tax breaks to churches, it's not that they are uh, trying to get people to convert to those. Uh, the problem with that 
is that they are helping, they are aiding religion. Um, and it's kind of the same thing here. The government is uh, promoting religion, it, not in the sense of getting people to convert to Judaism, which it, it's not trying to do, um, and, and I don't think that anybody sees it that way. Uh, the problem is just that it's uh, spending money on putting up a religious symbol uh, to the exclusion of uh, other religious symbols and to the exclusion of non-religion. Non Dave, far be it from me to be the kind of pox on all your houses kind of guy, but there is a part of your argument that I sort of have a problem with, and that sure, is the, the position you have about sort of how the Holocaust was prosecuted. The ratio, as I've always been led to believe, was massively, was, was actually very in favor of the Jews, three to two almost. And the fact of the matter is... I don't think is, you want to use the term in favor of. Fair point. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, Wow. I might almost shut up with that, but anyway, to go on, uh, the Nazis did make the distinction of Jews versus their their efforts at at creating a master race. They actually singled the Jews out for persecution for for the furtherance of their political efforts, and that I think is something that we have to pay very close attention to. And to throw and I think you might be throwing the baby out with the bathwater when you position yourself somewhat otherwise. Well, I mean, even if even if this were just about the Jews, uh, even if there were no other victims, uh, e even if we define the Holocaust so narrowly as to say that it was just the extermination of Jews, and uh, and Hannah, I I didn't say a Jewish nation earlier. I'm not sure uh, if you misheard me or or something. I but, think I think she was uh, referring to your boss, Dave. Oh, uh, it's possible. Yeah, um, I, I don't. I may have misspoken. He said Jewish I nation did. on Fox News. He said Jewish nation. Oh no, I'm sorry. The anchor woman said Jewish nation. Okay. Thank you, woman. Said Jewish nation. So. Oh, um, I may have. I may have been wrong. Oh, you may. Have. Okay. Um, I I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, I I just uh, I think the the point. Okay, if even if we're defining Holocaust so narrowly as to be just uh, the extermination of the Jewish people, uh, the ethnic Jewish people, regardless of whether they practice Judaism or not, the Nazis did not distinguish. Um, even in that case, I would still say that. The, dis the prominent display of a religious symbol on government land is something that we should be concerned about. And that's the context. core of the argument I think we need to stick with. I so don't think no, we need to, to get clear, into revisionist history. Yeah. There, there is no situation in which you think the prominent display of any religious symbol whatsoever has any legitimate secular purpose in America. For a, for a memorial, no. I would like to live with a government that does not include religious symbols Final. Now, when we're talking about the case of history, when we're talking about museums, I think it's very hard to separate religious symbols from the human context. And I would make I would make it I would make an exception there. The only other exception I would make are places like grave sites where the land really belongs to the families of the people who were buried there, and they would want some sort of religious representation. Outside of that, I want no religious symbols in my government. Because Sam, what's your view? What's your view then on the 9/11 cross in the Holocaust Memorial? On the Holocaust Museum? I'm sorry, in the 9/11 Museum at the 9/11 at the Memorial. The, 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 the cross. I understand how meaningful that cross is to a lot of people, and I understand how terrible 9/11 is. But once again, we have you know a cross being put on public land. It's just something you I'm not really against. Make an exception Isn't that to a museum? museums. Right, it is a museum. Is it a museum? It yes. Seems, it seems like it's a museum, but it also seems like it's not. I'm, I'm having trouble with the context there. I understand that this is not cut and dry. It's not. I'm willing to go with you. I, I think sometimes it is, especially when you have the political climate that we have these days. You have to. I think we do have to be careful. I understand about picking your battles, but to say that we're we're not doing this over tactical reasons is an entirely different situation than saying we're not doing this over ethnical re ethical reasons. The fact of the matter today is that as an atheist community, we're talking about allowing a Star of David on in a memorial and not even a museum on public land while we are asking for crosses to be removed. I think that's going to set a very negative precedent, and I don't see how that's going to be seen as, a, as anything other than legal establishment by the people. There's going to be thousands of lawyers pro bono who would love to work on that. I'm not a lawyer, but I can already see that, and everybody I've been, you know, I've been hearing that more than once. Why don't we let Michael Dodora get in here, the public policy director for the Center for Inquiry. 
Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Thankfully, thankfully, we can hear your beautiful voice, Michael. James, it's a pleasure to join you, Dan, everyone else. Uh, I've been listening for probably 20 minutes or so. And it's been a great conversation. Uh, I've learned a lot just in the 20 minutes that I've listened. I know that you've been going for almost two hours or an hour and a half. About an hour. We started a little late. Let's you might go. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure that it's been a wide range of conversation. Just uh, a couple of thoughts about uh, this issue. So it was interesting. Dan, I think Dan was the one that alerted to me. Me to the issue. I was at the CFI leadership conference in uh, Amherst this past, past weekend, and uh, if anyone's ever been to CFI, you can sit in this back patio area where you can s see people in the front who are just kind of hanging out in the front patio. And Dan was out there with a couple people, and his arms were just kind of going crazy. And you could tell he was very animated about this issue. So I went up to him and I said, "You know, what were you talking about?" And he was like, "Oh, it's this Holocaust, you know, thing in Ohio." <laughs> it's like, all right. So we sat down for a couple hours, and James joined us, and we had a pretty enlightening conversation about it. Um, I wouldn't deny that it's a complex issue, and I think I sympathize with a lot of the people who say, you know, public uh, lands should not have religious symbols on them. Uh, at the same time, I know that the courts look at the context and the intent and what's conveyed with that religious symbol. And I think there are good reasons why the court does that. And I think, uh, you know, in this specific case, there are good reasons why it could be worthwhile to mention that in the Holocaust, the Jews were a particularly damaged portion of society. Uh, at the same time, I, I can understand people who say, I'm a little uncomfortable putting a Star of David uh, on public lands. You know, uh, CFI, uh, Dan, I don't know if you got a chance to read uh, Ron Lindsay's remarks, but... CFI doesn't have an official position on this case. In fact, FFRF and AA haven't even actually made the threat to sue. I think they just kind of said, hey, what's going on over there? Um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's good that people are talking about this thing. It, I, actually, I think it's really important that people get the idea, which you can get from the, what, 10 or 11 screens that you see right here, that there's a difference of opinion in the atheist and secular and skeptic community on a lot of different church state issues. Um, but we talk about them, we try to make sense of them, So that's, and I guess that's what we're doing here. I, I, think, I think personally, uh, I don't really know how I feel about the case. It's not something that uh, I feel particularly offended by. I don't think that in any way this is a favoring of religion. I don't think it's a privileging of religion. I don't think in any way the government is trying to make anyone feel that you know Judaism or even God or religion is a, is a particularly good thing that you should believe in. I think some people just are trying to recognize that something really terrible happened and it, and it harmed in specific a, a group of people the, per, perhaps the most. Uh, but in terms of the, the court system, I mean, I, I don't think... I don't think there's really a case here. I, I don't think the court would look at this and say, well, it feels kind of like a synagogue or it feels like they're trying to push uh, Judaism on anybody. Uh, what's going to actually happen in the courts if, if it went to court, I don't know. But um, that all being said, in my conversations even at the CFI leadership camp and in the 20 minutes that I've been listening to people here, uh, I've heard I've heard some pretty interesting arguments, and uh, it's made me reflect a bit more on my position. So, in in the minutes that last, I hope I don't say the last thing because that's I don't want to be the person that has to end this thing. Uh, but in the minutes that last year, I hope I hear some some more interesting points, and uh, I hope that people write about this and and keep talking about this because even if there's no court case, I think this is an interesting issue. The issue of um, whether or not the government should be in the business of recognizing and perhaps even funding religious symbols on public lands. That's a very broad question. There's a lot of context to that. The courts look at that context, and I think we all need to think about it going forward. So, okay. thanks for having me. Uh, would you like to jump in? Yes. Um, I listened to David Silverman's uh, interview over and over and over again, and I, I couldn't believe my ears. Uh, to me, you know, I, as, a, as an ethnic Jew and a pretty hardcore atheist, um, I came to, to see that um, 
religion should not be exempt from from critical analysis and and any more than any other paranormal belief. But the Holocaust was what it was. I mean, it, the 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 evidence that um, Dr. Gorski um, posted on on your Facebook thread that that was um, this chapter and verse about about um, how the Holocaust was designed to kill Jews, and that the other that the other groups were swept in, you know, just political dissidents, gays, anybody who wasn't you know good enough to be an Aryan, and um, and what this argument made me feel was that I began to kind of check my atheist cred, and you know wonder what am I more, you know, and um, do I skeptic first, an atheist by applying skepticism to religious claims, or an ethnic Jew who doesn't believe in a supernatural being who answers prayers and runs things. And I started checking it out with, because I, I mostly have um, friends who are skeptics, that they, there's some overlap, but there are atheists who are not skeptics, and that there are skeptics who are not atheists. And um, one of my friends said that that he felt that that the Jews have been um, kind of uh, pushing the Holocaust button for 60 years, and it was time to put it behind us. And so I looked at what he was thinking, and I was feeling, gee, you know, he feels differently than the way I feel. And then I discussed it with my friend Heather, who is a host of Ardent Atheist podcast. And um, and she she asked me some relevant questions, and one of them was, would I feel different if it was a cross on the memorial, on a memorial, instead of a Star of David? And w would I be more concerned about it or worried about it? And number one, I don't know. I grew up in California, and this is where the Spaniards, you know, the, ex the Spanish explorers and the Padres. Um, just built missions up and down the coast. And now those, I mean, they are in our environment. I grew up with studying California history and, and kind of never thinking twice about it. And, the, um, you know, it just seemed normal. And there's those, the, the missions are now museums or archaeological sites um, that El Camino Real is marked on our highways by mission bells and they're just in the environment and we're just surrounded by it but that is how the Catholic Church got its foothold in the New World and and I guess it does bother me you know the and and then last year actually maybe it was two years ago there was a um, along the Pacific Palisades overlooking the ocean there's a park and every year they have a drawing for um, for space for displays. And there was an, uh, uh, a secular group that won one of the drawings and put up a secular display for the for winter solstice. And I guess the people went crazy. You know, they they thought that was was a terrible thing and it wasn't religious and it was Christmas time and you know snowflakes just weren't making it. So. The other thing was that, you know, when Heather brought that up with me, was that I don't know what it feels like to be Christian. You know, I'm ethnically Jewish. My parents really never talked about the Holocaust. I didn't even know about the Holocaust until I got to college, and a friend of mine who was an Israeli took me to, um, to see a French film called, well, now I can't remember the name of it, but it, it, was, it was a documentary that was about, the Holocaust, and I said, what is this? What is this? You know, I, d I didn't know, but slowly I began to learn. He explained to me what he could. I don't know why my parents never talked about it. It was definitely not in the history books. The Holocaust was only a footnote in the history books when I was in high school, and, and th they had every battle of the, of the, of the, of World War II and all the generals and, and every, but everything but the Holocaust. And, it, and I don't know if that was deliberate revisionism or, or um, kind of obligatory um, uh, discrimination. I'm not sure. 
Wendy, but, you have 20, minutes, 20 seconds left. I'm sorry to cut you off. Okay. That's about... That's about it. That's about what I wanted to say is that I don't I don't know what it feels like to be other than Jewish and I think that the star is appropriate. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce Patrick. You haven't spoken yet, Patrick. Why don't you join me? Howdy. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a couple of really quick points that I had. Um, as somebody who's very aware that uh, Jews are not the only victims of the Holocaust, um, the monument design it's built around the Star David, but the monument itself clearly acknowledges that they weren't the only targets. It is a matter of historical fact. As primary targets, it was that popular and pervasive anti-Semitism that allowed the Nazis to whip up the frenzy that did result in the camps. Um, it's a matter of history. The use of the six-pointed star in this context, it's not a call of praise for Yahweh. Nobody's building a synagogue. Um, I'm strong I, in the First Amendment. I'm strong on establishment. Fighting against this falls into a pattern that was pointed out by Native American activist, author Vine Deloria. He said, we see two major trends emerge. We can always devise the proper rhetoric so church schools can be funded as if they were public schools, and we can prohibit the display of almost anything hinting at religious belief or sentiment in any public place. And I think that fighting so hard on this second point, on removing something that hints to someone about religious belief when it's a multivalent symbol, is just putting the effort there and letting them slide right into the schools where it's going to make a difference. Okay. Yeah. Rant um, over. <laughs> Thank you. I do want to speak about the pushing the Holocaust button, and I have heard that a bit in the comments, and uh, I try not to but judge people p purely by internet comments, but yeah, pushing the, bu the Holocaust button for 60 years, that's, that's a fairly terrible thing to say. That's a social phenomenon. That, that's, that, that's a tragedy that has social phenomena that lasts to this day. And that's, and that's really a, an important thing to realize, that 60 years, biologically, historically, is not a very long time. We're going to be feeling the effects of this for hundreds of years. We'll and feel it's it precisely, most if we forget it. Yeah, I think we'll feel it either way, but you do have a point. But people are already starting to with this, uh, with this rhetoric. Absolutely so, which is why I'm not against a why I'm not against a memorial, I'm not against the Holocaust Museum, I think there should be a memorial, and I think this particular memorial is very nice looking, I would just like it to be on private land. But the fact of the matter is, again, we must look at the wider context, not just historically, not just within the context of Jewish culture, but we must look at it within the context of American politics. And I'm really afraid that in places, you know, in, in the places that aren't major cities where there aren't a lot of, you know, political liberals, that this could be used, as he says, as a, as a backdoor method to get dominionism and a, a Judeo-Christian, you know, front put into education. And I think that would badly serve the victims of the Holocaust. What's that? You kind of reversed what I said. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> what I said is that focusing on this, focusing on getting this thing that appears to be a religious symbol that's actually a multivalenced symbol, and it, it just did. and it boggles my mind that religion has so much power in the secular community that if a symbol is used religiously in one context, suddenly it's a religious symbol in all contexts. Religion has wow. so much power. Who's got the power there? Religion has so much power, period. I'll give you that for free. Look at history. Look at how much domination religion has had over history. And that is exactly the kind of thing we're fighting. At the end what, of the day, this is what I think we are here for. All this fight is going to do is set up a backlash that's going to stop. It's going to distract from the fights, like I said, of keeping public funding out of religious schools. It's going to dis distract from that. It's Like I said, you're setting up a backlash. You're, you're, you're standing here going, all right, here we go. We're going to fight against this. And in the end of the day, the secular community is going to look like fools. But I, I think in a social justice movement, we occasionally have to do things that the, the masses are going, or that the majority or the people with privilege or whatever you want to call them are going to find bad or uncomfortable, and you'll always sort of risk backlash. Right, I think but, that's sort of one of the problems that we face as social activists. But Sam, but Sam, like the question is whether or not you want to consider whether or not you want to take on Jews as the people with privilege, even though they're religious. They're specific. I'm not and, taking and on the issue. Jews. Well, no, no, but okay, but but listen, I want you to read uh, uh, um, from from uh, uh, Gorsky's blog. He quoted uh, Gord McPhee, who cited a bunch of scholarship, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of research uh, in, in the books he's bringing this from, and he, and he sums it up this way. He says the ultimate aim. And the primary target never varied. Others were murdered in the course of the final solution. 
gypsies, Russian POWs, homosexuals, Jehovah Witnesses, and so on. But the first and constant target was always the Jews. The final solution was intended for the Jews. It was about the Jews and chiefly affected the Jews. There is no denying that. Without the Jews, there is no final solution. To minimize or trivialize the Jewishness of the final solution is to seriously understate, if not unintentionally perhaps, deny its essence. This does not mean that the suffering of other groups is to be ignored. On the contrary, it was terrible. But without the Holocaust, without the final solution of the Jewish question, the others live. The term Holocaust is coined to describe the uniquely Jewish aspect of the final solution. It does not seek to negate the suffering of other victims. Now, in that sort of a context, what he's saying is to deny the Jewishness is almost to deny the Holocaust as the specifically the Holocaust and not a wide genocide. Now, this is rhetoric anti-Semites use. And as okay, a result that, that of taking rhetoric, that, that, Hold on a second, hold on. That might be rhetoric that might use, but it's not let, rhetoric Let me I finish, use. though. Like, All right. Sam, please. To have David Silverman make this the emphasis in order to say that this was too Jewish a monument, you, can turn that on. you had him go on Fox News and say it wasn't about the Jews, it was about eugenics primarily, that they were not a primary target. That is being construed as Holocaust denialism, and even though I do not agree with that, we have opened that door by making, we have atheists running up and down now, on my Facebook wall, on my blog, making the argument that the Jews are being overrepresented in this. And they're sounding like anti-Semites on an issue we should never go near sounding like them. That is not the time to piss off the powerful. You're, you're going very near insult. Uh, I, and I understand that you're not trying to do that, so I am not as it stands. David Silverman denied the Holocaust. I'm not talking about David Silverman. I'm talking about myself. For one thing, I'm not talking I about you. I'm not talking about you. I'm saying you did that, say you. <laughs> no, I didn't mean you specifically. I just meant okay. those who make those arguments. I don't think you said it. I'm saying to you, we shouldn't pick this fight. That's all. I can understand not picking this type this fight on a tactical basis. I can understand that if I'm working, if I'm Dave. And I'm at American Atheists, and my lawyer comes to me and says, "This is what's going. This is how it's going to go legally." I understand that, but that's not the argument that you're making. And I've said at the outset, at the very beginning of this argument, that this is that the Holocaust targeted the Jews. They were hurt the most by this, by this genocide, by this terrible thing. But is Jewish cult Jewish culture is wide enough? The history is detailed enough, and artistic expression is so varied that we must include that we can't avoid a religious symbol. There is so much there. The history is so deep. The culture so wide. Can't we pick something else that doesn't skirt the law like this? Can't so we go with something else? No one has claimed that the Jewish star is obligatory. Lots of people have made the very good point that there are other beautiful memorials that don't include it. Um, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the, the existence of it is therefore intrinsically unreasonable or illegal. I mean, look, I think there are plenty of reasons for other people not, I mean, they don't work for me, but for other people to be wary for whatever reason. Um, be wary of Judeo-Christian dominionism, be wary of, of what, it, of what the, the memorial would mean if it was phrased a different way about religious Jews. But we have to look at the memorial in its own terms and the way that it functions. And what the governor says on his terms is how he interprets the memorial, and that is uninclusive and wrong. But the memorial itself is not uninclusive and is not unreasonable insofar as it prominently displays one of the most relevant symbols of the Holocaust. Under, under that term, the Ten Commandments monument may be just as okay, and that's what I'm concerned about. It's how not is that? The, the Ten Commandment monument oh. in Florida. It's, it's a, a people often use it as a way to say that, oh, these, this is morality that everybody follows. Whether Sorry, I'm Christian sliding down a slippery okay. slope Sam, right you're now. Out of time. Thank you very much, Sam. You can stick around, but you're out of time. Mm, slippery slope. <laughs> well, well, let me add something to the conversation here. I, I, we, we often, we're talking about the term unreasonable, and just because I'm making a reasonable argument or I have a reasonable position doesn't mean that you have an unreasonable position. I believe there are numerous reasonable positions that are being put forth in this conversation. And I really hope we don't lose sight of that. Uh, I'm going to give a different way of framing the argument in that the quote-unquote target 
of my concern is not Judaism, it's not religion, it's the state of Ohio. It's the government. It's ensuring that the government is respecting the limitations on its power, the Establishment Clause being one of those. And based upon my reading of the law, and I do not do First Amendment law full-time, in fact, I don't even practice law full-time, but based on my relatively intelligent and educated view of the law, I do not view FFRF's interpretation as a stretch. I do not view this as a case where they are trying to take new ground. And so I look at the law and I say, using the existing tests, it is reasonable, in fact, I'm going to say more likely than not, possibly even higher than that, that this is an Establishment Clause violation. And so my request as an individual, and Mallory mentioned the SSA shouldn't be getting involved in this, throughout this entire conversation I've been here individually. I, I do not represent the SSA on this issue. We have no public position on this issue right now. But it's about the government doing good works through the power that it has. An analogy I've used previously is with the takings clause. If the state of Ohio should open my front yard and said, we're going to put a memorial to Operation Enduring Freedom on your front yard, and we're not going to pay just compensation for that, I would be very angry about that because they are required to pay just compensation to take private property for public use. That doesn't mean that I'm against memorializing the numerous uh, casualties and other people impacted by, those, by that war. It's just me saying, dear government, please do this the right way. And the existing tests, based on my reading of those, says that using a religious symbol, even if it's a multivalent symbol, which it is, but using a symbol that is religious in this manner is a violative of the Establishment Clause. And, and I think one of the things that, that, that's relevant here with the uh, uh, showing that there are, all, are alternatives, and, and I understand uh, Mallory's point that uh, uh, the alternatives may not be visually appealing the way they were presented, but the, the fact that the alternatives exist uh, falls back on, on, what was it, ACLU versus Eccles, uh, yes. if, there, if there is a, uh, a way that they can do the same thing that does not result in excessive tang uh, entanglement, then that is the preferred way to do it. And Yeah, and that's what I said at the very beginning of this, and that, that's our position on it as well. Doing this right is hard is not a defense to an Establishment Clause violation. So I want to say a couple of things. I mean, firstly, I want to echo some of the things that, that Michael said a little while back, which is I actually understand the concern around this. And I can understand why people would have an immediately skeptical reaction as to whether this is a good idea uh, to not oppose. I think that whenever the government wants to put up what is ostensibly a large religious symbol on public land, we should go, wait a minute, what's going on there? We should really scrutinize very carefully what's happening. So I, I, I respect that um, that instinct. What disturbs me is that, that, that the way that instinct is being expressed in this instance seems to me to ignore central, important, historical, contextual facts that just cannot be ignored in a reasonable, civilized society. I mean, th this is just in no way similar to putting up a large Christian cross without context on the lawn of a state house or putting up a large, although it would never happen, a large um, crescent and star on the lawn of a state house. It is in the context of a memorial which memorializes a particular historic event within which a particular symbol, regardless of its history of religious use, was used to demarcate an ethnic group for extermination. That's very important, an ethnic group, because as Dan said earlier, this was this was uh, people being identified regardless of whether they were practicing religious Jews or not. There was no there was no that was no defense to say I I am not a God believing practicing Jew was no defense in the Holocaust. So in this context, it seems to me abundantly clear that the symbol does not represent excessive entanglement between. Uh, church and state, and that the interpretation that it does relies on an extraordinarily unsophisticated ahistorical view. You have to be willfully ignorant about history and about the facts of the monument in order to interpret it as a, as a form of endorsement of the Jewish faith. And I think that that disturbs me. I don't think a movement that prides itself on its rationalism and its, on its clear thinking should, in this case, make its arguments on the basis, and I've heard this argument made this evening and on blogs and on Facebook pages a lot, 
that someone driving by would assume that it's a it's an endorsement of Judaism. This is not the standard of argument that I think I feel like I'm going to be hit by a train at any moment. Yeah, who's um, who's <laughs> train is? I, I feel like we should be more um, intellectually sophisticated than that in our arguments. I don't want to live in a democracy which says, as a blanket rule, on no under no circumstances should any religious symbol ever be presented to the public on public land at public expense because I think that's a sort of totalitarianism of thought that rejects context, re rejects historical nuance and that doesn't think intelligently about these questions. Again, I, I say this sort of monument is exactly what I want our government to be doing. I think we should be celebrating the fact that Ohio wants to recognize the Holocaust. I think they sh we should be celebrating the fact they made a good aesthetic judgment between the different options that they had on the table. This seems to be the one that most appropriately and powerfully expresses what they wanted to express. And the idea that it represents an endorsement of Judaism, I've heard no cogent argument to support that case. James, I agree with pretty much everything you said on historical context, and the conclusion that I have, and unfortunately I, I don't have the time to lay out the legal argument in the less than two minutes <laughs> I have remaining, but my conclusion individually from looking at the law is that it doesn't change the outcome, that it's still an Establishment Clause violation. You, do, you th do you think that's the spirit of the law, though? To answer that question would be extraordinarily complicated, just because we're going into the nature of the common law, we're going into the nature of constitutional interpretation, and in that we have snippets of text which we then have to apply, and we apply them by coming up with standards. But morally, what would you say? Don't think like a lawyer, morally. If you were starting a country, would you make this law read this way? I would have to think very hard about that question. Uh, as I've been preparing for this conversation, one of the things that, that has kept coming back to me is that we don't have exceptions to the Establishment Clause. Uh, for free speech, the government can regulate and restrict free speech, given, in fact, the content of free speech, not just the time, place, and manner, uh, under compelling, uh, compelling interest, uh, narrowly tailored. There's no such restriction or no such escape clause, as it were, on the Establishment Clause. In fact, we've got the Supreme Court saying that the government can regulate the content of free speech in order to avoid an Establishment Clause violation. So, you know, again, I don't have the time to start over from the very beginning and say if I was drafting the Constitution from scratch, how would I do it in order to best encapsulate these moral concerns, to use your phrase. Um, but looking at the existing framework, the ones that we have right now and that we have to work with, uh, my conclusion is it's an Establishment Clause violation. Um, I think I think the Establishment I mean, I think the establishment Clause is very important. I think it was Sam Mulvey who, who pointed out uh, the question of, or perhaps it was Patrick, about taxes, about taxes being, tax-exempt churches being a form of favoritism even if it doesn't uh, compel people to become religious. And I mean, I think that's a great point. So the question for me is sort of an Occam's razor approach. Do does the existence of the star in the position that it exists on the memorial require the additional explanation of favoritism in order to explain its existence? And I think if it did, then that would be an exceptionally good argument. But as a matter of fact, it doesn't. There are perfectly good reasons, a priori, that we might expect a star like that, that looks like that, in that position, to be on such a memorial. Um, even if it was on public ground. And so we don't need the additional explanation. And so the Establishment Clause doesn't seem to, to be required to explain what's going on. I'd like to pose a question to Dave. Uh, Dave, what would you say in response? I, I've, I've uh, strongly criticized Dave Silverman. Can you please talk about his Fox News appearance? Uh, I don't have the transcript up in front of me. Um, which part of that specifically are you concerned about? When when the anchor said that the primary target was the Jews and he corrected her, tried to correct her that it was about eugenics instead. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on the history of this. Uh, it's my understanding just from, from what I've read in the last couple of days since we've been looking into this. 40% uh, of the victims were not Jewish and they were not targeted for any reason relating to Judaism. Um, I apparently um, from this conversation, uh, it seems that this started as targeting uh, 
the Jewish people, uh, not just Jew, religious Jews. Um, and that may be the case. But if this memorial is about the Holocaust as a whole, um, just showing the one symbol I think is, is unfair to the 40%, which is not a small um, proportion of the people involved in this um, who weren't. And I mean, the way that, that my boss, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to call me Moscato and him Dave, that's how we do it at the office. Um, the way that Dave phrased it on the air as far as saying uh, it's important that we not give the Holocaust to the Jews. Um, I, I think there's more eloquent ways to put that, and he thinks so too. Um, it's The Holocaust was primarily about Judaism and about uh, exterminating the Jewish people as a whole, and I think we all agree with that, and that's that's historically accurate. Um, we're not trying to, to deny that that's true. But if you're going to uh, put up a memorial about the Holocaust as a whole, um, especially given the question of entanglement, I think it makes sense to choose a design, given that we have available alternatives, um, that doesn't pull up that question of, is, is this an entanglement issue? Uh, one, in addition to the fact that the other designs would more fairly represent everybody that was a victim of this. And I just think that makes the most sense. It's, it seems like such an easy answer. Uh, we have right here a design that we could use that doesn't do that. Um, they haven't built it yet. They haven't committed to anything yet. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me why they don't just say, OK, we'll just do something else so that it doesn't cause a problem. But what, can you just quickly answer, do you, do you agree with, uh, like, why would you say that, that, that a fight that gets us entangled in these ancillary issues and risks charges, even if they're baseless, risks charges of this Holocaust denial, isn't that shredding into ground that distracts from the core mission? Well, you made the point earlier that, uh, that we're using rhetoric that's similar to rhetoric that Holocaust deniers use, and that's troublesome because uh, people... Uh, outside observers of this might think of us as Holocaust deniers on that basis. And that, that may be. There are always going to be ignorant people who aren't paying close attention, who think that we're not saying what we're really saying. Uh, I mean, we get letters all the time of people calling us Satanists and so on, and we're not Satanists, and anybody who knows anything about atheism would clearly understand that we're not Satanists. But I don't think that's a good reason uh, to avoid using the specific wordings that we're using if they're actually accurate um, just on the basis of we don't want people to accidentally misunderstand us. I mean, I and I said this somewhere on Facebook too, I am absolutely happy to publicly say that Jesus was not the Son of God, Jesus was not a God, and, uh, and I don't apologize for saying that. And somebody might say, well, uh, you know, an Islamic a terrorist is also going to deny that Jesus was a god, and we shouldn't say that because uh, people might misunderstand us and think of us as Islamic terrorists. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, but it's still true, and I'm still going to say it regardless of whether other groups that I don't agree with say the same thing um, just by coincidence, and I think that's the, the major point. So Dave Moscato has used up his time. Okay, uh, okay. So the, the people left are Patrick, uh, Michael, uh, Brian. Uh, Hannah has a very little bit of time left. Does any of you want to speak? Uh, and, and maybe Neil has a little bit of time. Well, I'll go ahead and kind of give my closing thoughts uh, and burn whatever time I've got left. Um, One minute. And okay. <laughs> All right. I'll feed, um, I'll feed my time to Neil, by the way. Well, I, okay. I, I you cede the rest of your time to Neil, Brian? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So you um, have uh, three minutes and 47 seconds. Okay. Well, then. Um, one of the key points that I'd make that, that has really been refined from this conversation, and I'm very thankful for that and also to the people that are no longer here, um, is that if there were some sort of balancing test or some sort of test on the establishment clause like we have with the government regulating the content of free speech, uh, a compelling governmental interest and narrowly tailored, um, if we had such a test, uh, I think this would be a fantastic example of when that test would be passed. But we don't. We have tests that say, we have cases that together say that um, if you have a 
religious symbol, even if that symbol has other meaning, has secular meaning, has cultural meaning uh, within you know, the, the Holocaust, within the context of World War II, this was not a symbol of Jewish faith necessarily. This was a death mark. This was, if you have this, you're going to die. And that has incredible cultural and historical significance. And the case law that we have, and this is an American atheist case predominantly that I look to, is the Utah Highway Patrol Association, where we have these large Latin crosses that have cultural significance to the Christians, as well as having general significance as a symbol of death and remembrance. And the court said if there's multiple significances to it, the fact that it is religious also impacts the Establishment Clause. And the court ended up ruling that, uh, Tenth Circuit, said that uh, this is a violation of the Establishment Clause, even if there's additional meanings to it. And the ACLU v. Eccles case that FFRF mentioned uh, in their initial letter to the state of Ohio um, says that the uh, government cannot use uh, religious means to pursue secular ends if non-religious means are available. And so the, the argument that I have, and this might be, might be a point where I'm persuading, I wish Mallory were, were still here, is if you could argue that it's not possible to have an effective Holocaust memorial without having the Star of David standing alone in a point of prominence, then I might be persuaded. I might say, okay, ACLU v. Eccles, you know, that language you know, doesn't control anymore um, because we can't use non-religious means for it. Um, but I don't think that's a winning argument. Um, so, again, the key thing for me is this is about a limitation on the government's power. Um, and the, the focus, I think, generally should be about recognizing that there's multiple reasonable arguments uh, to be had here. Um, I don't think anyone who has argued against me is unreasonable um, that, that, that are here. Um, but I would, I would really in, encourage us to focus on what individuals are saying um, as opposed to how other people outside the movement might be reacting. I look to the ACLU, they've taken on a lot of really unpopular cases before, um, and they're still going strong. I mean, I, I look to them as an inspiration um, to the type of organizations that I, I want to be involved in. Um, so just because this particular case is unpopular, if it is consistent with where the case law is, uh, then I think an organization that focuses uh, on litigation like FFRF or that has a significant nexus with that, like American Atheists, I don't think they're wrong to pursue it. So okay, I'll go ahead you and... Know, would you yeah. say that in, in a controversial case where reasonable people can disagree with the court against us, is it really the wisest one to pursue when we can let it be and it wouldn't serve as precedent? Well, there, there, there's a lot of courts that are involved. 99% of the cases that are appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States are never heard by SCOTUS. And so, yes, and this is earlier in the conversation with Trevor, where we were talking about the mess that is Establishment Clause jurisprudence. Um, in any given case that is taken up regarding the Establishment Clause, um, that, that SCOTUS takes up, they can decide, we're going to quote-unquote fix this. It's, you know, to quote Justice Brennan, the most important law at the Supreme Court is the law of five. With five votes, you can do anything around here. Okay, your time is up, Neil. I just want to make a quick point sure. about that. One thing Trevor's article against the F uh, talking about the FFRF strategy, uh, he argued that yes, they can undo it. Like in 1986, there was a ruling against gays. It was very vile, and, mm -hmm. and they were able to undo it in 2003. But the point was that it, he made that if you put ruling after ruling in a row for 25 straight years, it's going to be harder for them to overturn precedent as opposed to, oh yeah, 25 years ago we made a mistake, because even 25 years is a short time to overturn precedent. Uh, let's, let's let the other people who haven't spoken, uh, who have left time, uh, Hannah has a minute and 40 seconds to close, James has a minute to close, and Michael has two minutes to close, and then I'm going to thank all of you and, and we're done. So let's start with Hannah, and then Michael, and then James. Okay, well, I just really appreciate being asked to speak. Um, I really just want to close by saying that I found what Neil just said um, very compelling. I really understand the idea that we feel that it would be so easy to just do something else. Um, and really, what I have to say in the defense is simply that um, while I, d I do understand that, and I do understand a vision of secularism that includes that, that vision of secularism is not mine, and I don't think it's the ideal one. Uh, I guess I'm a little bit echoing James, but the secular community that I want is one that does understand religion. I mean, one of the amazing things about atheists is, is those arguments when they understand the Bible better than everyone else. Um, and this could be an instance of that in which we understand 
the history and the function and all of that in a way that is sophisticated enough to allow us to make important distinctions between, for instance, tax breaks to churches and this memorial. And I also want us to be able to say, you know, I'm a little bit wary of this as a possible creepy dominionist outreach to Jews from a pretty Christian governor without saying, therefore, we must, we must be so, frankly, a little paranoid and on our guard about religious symbols that we never allow the context to override that. Um, and that's, that's a vision of atheism that I think is totally possible and that I want to see happen. Um, but I really appreciate the arguments that have been made uh, contra. That's my close. Michael, two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes, thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dan, for organizing this and putting all the efforts into getting everyone. Uh, again, I know that I missed the majority of the conversation, uh, but I can tell from, the, again, the half an hour or hour or so that I've caught that there has been an intense and vibrant conversation about separation of church and state in America. And I think that's a good thing. I think um, the fact that there's a different opinion on this shouldn't really su be surprising to us. I mean, I think it's one thing. We all agree, like, the, the Ten Commandments and the cross on the front of the Supreme Court or something is bad. Giving money to Christian schools to teach kids that the world is 6,000 year old and that, like, there, there are cases that we can all get around the table and say, like, that's definitely separation of church and state violation, no doubt about it. This is a, a case on the border, on the edge, and I think it's, it's good that we're all having a civil conversation about this and not not tearing each other apart. Um, that being said, I think there are some interesting questions to think about going forward, and I think that we should all think about this going forward. Obviously, there are, there are two questions that seems people have been asking. One is the moral question of, is, is this inclusionary? Does it exclude anybody? Um, that's a question that is really complex, and, and I wish not to really talk about that in the probably minute that I have left. Uh, the church-state question, I think, is really interesting, though, uh, especially from the kind of secular perspective, because there's been so many cases that have been coming up for us that necessarily haven't gone uh, that well, and uh, we should be thinking very carefully about which cases we bring to court and which, which, we, which we don't, even if we think it's the right case. We have to be worried, I think, in the long run about setting precedent in cases, because then it's going to make it much tougher in 10 or 20 years to bring, to bring another <laughs> case. So. Um, um, you know, these are really these are really weighty questions, and I don't think there's going to be any definite answer that we're going to have after this Google Hangout is over. I, th I hope that people watch this still, and then I hope that the conversation continues on the blogs and Twitter and Facebook, and and that maybe in a year or two, when this comes up, kind of similar case, we're all able to come back here and have a civil conversation once again about about uh, what's a really important issue, and I think it's important that we all, as committed secularists, generally come together and have rational conversations about this stuff, because we, if we tear each other apart on this, then there's no way we're going to be able to look at those really obvious cases of separation of church and state and make sure that we're all working together on that stuff. So thanks again, Dan, for having us. I appreciate it. Uh, James, one minute, and then I'll just take 10, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. I, I guess all I want to say is, again, just to echo Michael's words of thanks. I think it's been a fascinating conversation. I've appreciated to hear the passionate views on all sides of this argument. I, I guess all I would say is that if I, let, let's grant as a hypothesis that Neil is right and there's a good legal case to be made against this memorial. I think in my view that would be a problem with our interpretation of the law or our laws and not a problem with the memorial. Because I think that there are versions of secularism which exist which take a sophisticated and nuanced view of what it means to promote religion and what freedom of religion actually means which would allow this memorial and celebrate this memorial as a legitimate expression of horror at a historical tragedy. I don't think that this memorial poses any threat to my freedom of religion or my freedom of conscience. I don't think any argument has been given as to why it should substantively. I'm not particularly moved by technical aspects of the law. I think we should look at what the laws are meant to achieve and what sort of society we want to live in and ask is this sort of memorial we think that the government should be building and I, I think it is. I, I think the last thing is to say that if we want our community to be viewed as sensitive, intelligent, thoughtful members of a national community, 
why not start a conversation like this with the people who wanted to build the monument a long time ago when it was proposed instead of um, sort of half threatening, not quite threatening lawsuits after it's been okayed. I think that we should engage in conversation and dialogue with people and express our views in much less declarative ways and then we might not get the sort of enormous backlash that we've already seen all across uh, the commentary on this issue. Thank you. And uh, I just want to echo everything James just said and I just want to stress again that if we fight every issue even when you know even if it's just a matter of the technicalities of the law and it's the spirit of the law which is preventing the imposition of religion preventing the government telling us we should be religious or follow a particular religion it looks like we're out to screw the religious anytime we can on any technicality and there are more rulings that go in favor of the religious that they're exploiting they do terrible things um, you know uh, prayers you know like like the, the inauguration of Obama was practically a religious service um, I mean, it was so religious in character, it was offensive, it upset me, it hurts me as a secular person, an atheist. There are so many things they do that they can get away with. And they, they, they take this, we can get away with it, let's push it, line. And I want to say this is one of the rare cases, I actually dif differ with FFRF and AA on these kinds of issues, because I'm against you know, the, the, the uh, you know, chaplain for the Congress, and I'm against, you know, um, I'm against faith-based initiatives. I'm against all of this stuff. The issue is on this issue, yeah, we might be able to get them technically on the law. I don't think we can, but we might. We shouldn't, is my point. Okay, I'm going to thank everyone for being here again. Um, and thank next you, on Sunday, I will be uh, interviewing on the Camels with Hammer show Anita Finlay, who wrote a book about sexism against Hillary Clinton in the 2008 uh, presidential campaign. So please tune in for that. Good night, everybody.